Hey everyone, welcome back, and thank you for joining us again in our next discussion of statistics. Heading into our objective then, a bit of review, because we're going to obtain a point estimate for the population proportion. We did this previously. Remember, a point estimate for population proportion would be represented by p hat. And we know that p hat is equal to an x over n, and that estimates the value of the parameter p. So a quick example, we're told in July of 2008 now, a Fullerton poll asked 1,783 registered voters nationwide whether they favored or opposed the death penalty for persons convicted of murder. 1,123 were in favor. We're told to obtain a point estimate for the proportion of registered voters nationwide who were in favor of the death penalty for persons convicted of murder. So just like we did previously, that means 1,783 represents our sample size, and 1,123 would be the number of people that were in favor. So that's our x. And since we're finding a point estimate for the proportion of voters who were in favor, we know we're just finding a p hat, which is our x over n, and that would be our 1,123 over our 1,783. And that gives us a p hat of a 0.6298. That takes us to our next objective then, which would be to construct and interpret a confidence interval for the population proportion. Just a quick note, the textbook uses the language 1 minus alpha times this 100% confidence interval. That is, the alpha level is going to be connected to our confidence level as well, as they end up being complements of each other. But we'll discuss that within the examples. First, a confidence interval is an interval of numbers based on a point estimate for an unknown parameter. This is a big deal because we no longer know the parameter. A lot of the examples we've been working with, they tell us the parameter, but this is getting closer to real life stats. We don't know the parameter, and instead we're gonna use sample information in order to build this confidence interval. Now the level of confidence represents the expected proportion of intervals that will contain the parameter if a large number of different samples is obtained. This sometimes gets a bit confusing, so just to elaborate, for example, a 95% level of confidence implies that if 100 different confidence intervals are constructed, each based on a different sample from the sample population, we will expect 95 of the intervals to contain the true parameter, and five of them would not include the parameter, meaning five of those guys we would expect to actually be misleading. Because keep in mind, we don't know the parameter. So instead, all we have is sample data leading us to this conclusion with some level of confidence. Now that takes us over to the requirements for constructing these confidence intervals about p hat. Now this topic ends up being a huge deal because we're gonna end up with these different requirements for different parameters. It ends up being one of the toughest challenges for students on the exam because our list of requirements ends up being pretty long. So suppose we're creating a confidence interval about p hat. Again, emphasis that we're still talking about proportions, where our sample size is n and our population size is capital N. Then we must check the following before we construct the confidence interval. First, we have to know that the data must come from a simple random sample, and most of the time this will be satisfied. The big one, though, is that we need to make sure we've got a distribution that is either normal or approximately normal. So if we don't know population information, using n times p hat times one minus p hat to ensure that it's greater than or equal to 10, we'll make sure that we've got a distribution of p hat that is at least approximately normal. Make sure we're careful here not to confuse it with past material though. Notice that we're using p hat, not p. We're using p hat because we don't have p. That's why we're constructing a confidence interval. We're using sample data to try to create a confidence interval in order to estimate population information. And finally, the sample size is no more than 5% of the population size. We've seen this sentence before where our sample size is less than or equal to our 0.05 of capital N, our population, and that will be typically satisfied as well. So that takes us over to the conversation about how do we construct these confidence intervals for our population proportions. Well, you see those beautiful formulas in front of you. Those would be the formulas that we're gonna use to construct these confidence intervals by hand. Make sure we realize we need to know how to do this by hand for the exam. We will also have calculator functions in order to construct these for us. Something to highlight real quick though, notice that the formulas for the lower bound and the upper bound are the same with one exception. We've got a minus and a plus going on for the lower and upper bound respectively. That is, the lower and upper bound, that is, the lower and upper bounds are both combinations of our sample proportion p hat, and then we are adding or subtracting some margin of error. The margin of error is calculated by incorporating z sub alpha over 2, and then multiplying that by the standard deviation of our sampling distribution of the sample proportions and z sub alpha over two is connected to the level of confidence that we desire when we build the confidence interval. Once we're comfortable with the formulas, we're gonna be allowed to combine these two formulas just to call them p hat plus or minus e. 
That is, instead of having to write the formula twice, it's going to be fine if we fill in the information and then tell the reader that we've got plus or minus these values to create both our lower and upper bounds. We'll elaborate on this when we do some examples as well, though. And finally, the last part of this introduction has to do with the interpretation of a confidence interval. Remember, a 95% confidence interval indicates that 95% of all simple random samples of size n from the population whose parameter is unknown will result in an interval that contains the parameter. It's tough to process that of all of this, we still don't know what the parameter is. That is, if we constructed 100 confidence intervals using the 100 simple random samples, then 95 of those intervals would contain the true value for the population. And we'll discuss how to state the interpretation of the confidence intervals with our examples. So heading into our first example, it's a little precursor before we go on to our construction of our confidence intervals. We're asked to find the critical value z sub alpha over 2 that corresponds to a 92% level of confidence. The big thing to be careful of here is that it's z sub alpha over 2, not just z sub alpha. It also corresponds to a 92% level of confidence, so we need to be thinking about this z sub alpha over 2 as it applies to confidence levels and confidence intervals. That is, if we had a normal distribution and we were constructing a confidence interval, then z sub alpha over 2 would be the positive value of z corresponding to our confidence interval. And if our level of confidence is a 92%, then that means we know 8% of our data is outside of that interval. That is, our alpha level is the complement of our confidence level. So alpha equals 1 minus a 0 0.92, which gives us a 0 0.08. And of course, that means alpha over 2 is a 0 0.04. Referring back to the graph, we know both visually and confirmed it mathematically that the area outside of what would be a confidence interval would be 8%, but it's split in half because we've got this symmetric situation. We stress this because to find z sub alpha over 2, we're actually finding z sub 0.04. A common mistake we see students make would be finding z sub 0.08, which is the alpha level, but we need alpha over 2. And we know to find z sub 0.04, or to find any critical value of z, we need to use the inverse norm function. I'm going 1 minus a 0.04, since 0.04 is our area to the right of the z that we're trying to find, and our value of z sub alpha over 2 ends up being about 1.75. Just a quick note, if we're asked to find the critical values plural, that is, instead of our answer being just 1.75, which is the positive value of z, critical values plural simply refers to the plus or minus of that quantity. That is, if we're ever asked to find critical values plural, they just want the positive and the negative of that value of z, so we'd be finding both. And thank you again for joining us.